now. Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast sponsored by Logos Bible Software, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. And today we're doing a book club episode. We have Mark Jones on today. He edited the two volume set called The Existence and Attributes of God, Updated and Unabridged. And it's uh, written by Stephen Charnock. Again, it's edited by Mark Jones. And we have Mark on today. We're going to be talking about this here in a moment. And it's published by our good friends at Crossway. So I want to make sure you guys go to our show notes and there's a link to Crossway. Hit that. Check out this two volume set. Get it for yourself or someone you know. And then, of course, some other information on our show notes. There's a link to find the closest Reformed or confessional churches near your area. So if you're looking for a church to call home or you know somebody that's looking for a church to call home, that's a great resource for you guys. Hit that link, type in your zip code, and some uh, church options come up for you. And then also, if you want to communicate with Peter and myself, ask questions or uh, dialogue, uh, Our email is probably the best way, guiltgracepod at gmail.com. We're also on social media. We're pretty active on Twitter and Instagram. It's the same handle for both, at guiltgracepod. You can also find these conversations, these uh, episodes on YouTube. So if that's more a better platform for you guys, switch over to YouTube, check out the video. Um, we have different playlists. So if you hit the playlist link, you'll see the categories nicely lined up for you guys. This is a book club episode. So you'd click the book club under the playlist and you'd see all the book clubs that we ever do. And then our other seasons as well. So it keeps a little bit more organized and uh, tidy for you guys. Um, other than that, uh, there's also the Patreon link in the show notes. So you heard me mention Logos Bible software. We can't thank them enough. They are our main sponsor. But we have some other bridge builders. Uh, you're going to hear some words from some of our bridge builder sponsors in the middle of this episode. And uh, also, if you are an individual and you want to help us out, feel free to click that Patreon link and see the different levels of giving to help us out. So with that said, if I haven't forgotten anything else, please let Peter further introduce Mark Jones today. Yeah, we have... Dr. Mark Jones serves as the pastor of Faith Vancouver Vancouver Presbyterian Church, which is a PCA in British Columbia, Canada. Mm -hmm. He has authored many books, including Living for God and God Is, and speaks all over the world in Christology and the Christian life. Mark and his wife, Barbara, have four children. As you guys notice, he's wearing a um, UW hat, which Nick got all excited about until they realized that that's not the hat that he was. Mm -hmm. he's, He's super excited where he went to. Wisconsin, not to Washington, but it's a pleasure having you on, yeah. regardless, Dr. Jones. Thank you for having me on, guys. Great to be here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. We were yeah, talking about football and college football a little bit and um, real football, American football, all that, mm-hmm. all that fun stuff, which we, mm-hmm. I'm sure we might kind of dip into a little bit as well. But for our listeners who, who may not know you, this is the, maybe the first time that they've I've heard your name, if they haven't um, seen your work or read your books before. Uh, if you can let our listeners know a little about yourself, uh, your background, uh, and your current work. I, uh, you, you, you mentioned the important parts. Uh, I'm a minister at a church in Vancouver. We have, um, we've started um, a, a sort of a site uh, not far from my house that's been really um, encouraging in how it's taken off. So I, I wake up on a Sunday, preach at 9 a.m. around the corner from my house, it's our church, drive into Vancouver, 35 minutes away, preach at 11 a.m. service, <laughs> then we have a 5 p.m. service, so Sundays for me are really busy. Uh, that usually flattens me out Mondays, but I Gosh. I am writing a book on um, backsliding in the Christian huh. life right now, and apostasy, not really uh, exciting topics, but I'm trying to make it a positive treatment, not yeah. just a, a scare treatment. Uh, so it's it's pastoral, then it's, it's sort of approach- mm-hmm. And then to sort of stay out of trouble, I coach soccer, football. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what we were talking about, football, soccer. Yeah, yeah. We're recording, yeah. American football. I couldn't coach that. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I coach soccer. My um, my my family's avid soccer uh, keeps us busy. Also, at the high school, my Christ- my kids go to a Christian high school. I coach the teams there, <laughs> girls and boys. And 
Um, and then I also do a lot of traveling and speaking. And, and actually, I'm starting a seminary in Cape Town called Trinity Reform College that huh. um, is huh. in process of not only being built, but being organized. So that's my... I wonder, one of my friends at Westminster has been talking about a seminary in South Africa. And I kind of wonder if it's that one. Yeah, if it's connected, uh, I'm working with Mark Garcia and Greystone as well and part of the uh, help and stuff. So I, maybe it, it connected, but huh. it, it's quite exciting. The buildings are beautiful. The campus is beautiful. It's It could be the most um, advanced technological or um, sort of seminary in South Africa when it's all done, huh. just so we can um, you know, develop at the modern age of classrooms that are yeah. high tech and all that. So yeah, it's exciting. That's awesome. Yeah. If you ever, if you, for some reason, see the name Alex Hewitson, um, I know him. I don't know if he will apply or, or whatever, but I know he's been talking about something like this. I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'll be at Westminster uh, end of the month and uh, I'm going to go walk around campus, say hi to some guys. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So um, about, so more about this work. So this is, it's a reprint from Crossway. So it's not, this is not a brand new book, but a reprint first publication from what I saw was 1682 um, and that I can I think that presumes that this is a seminal text for Christians if we reproduce this and it's being edited uh, mm -hmm. so it's it means that this means something to, to meditate on and, and glean scriptural truth from but um, kind of behind that who actually who is Stephen Charnock somebody's re listening to this like okay great Stephen Charnock no idea who that is um, yeah. who, who is he and uh, why is this book important for today he's uh he's 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 fairly well known of the puritans so you you have the the stalwarts you know john owen thomas goodwin mm -hmm. um, baxter bunyan they're kind of uh and then you kind of get a next level of, of at least familiarity because a lot of what we know of the puritans kind of has been mediated to us through like the banner of truth trust which reprinted certain works and not yeah. so we kind of uh, as a 20th 21st century um christian evangelical christians we've we've got some works that we are quite familiar with and then other works that weren't but if you go back to the 17th century and even 16th it doesn't always cor correlate to what was popular back then but this work uh is is quite well known i think hmm. most especially reformed evangelical christians would have heard of it and yep. many claims to have read it even yeah, uh, even though it's really long <laughs> i think dabble might be the better word yeah so, that's that's what i would say yeah i didn't read the entire thing i read a good chunk of it yeah yeah there should be a prize from crossway for someone who reads you know every word in the two volumes and and can and can honestly say before god they did yeah. and there should be a quiz that comes with the book too. Did you actually read this? If so, take the quiz. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know if you want. Yeah, I, that would scare me. I, and I edited it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he was an English Puritan theologian um, born in 1628 in London. Huh. And so he was a little was bit the same later. Same year that John Owen was born? No, he was 1616. Oh, uh, so, so this is a few, he was a few years earlier. Yeah, he's he's younger. He's, uh, you know, Goodwin was 1600. So you, you kind of have this. But uh, he's really kind of born in the perfect era to to have um, you know all the best works available to him, so that when he writes in uh, the latter part of the century, you know you, you're getting crystallization of the mm. doctrine of God, but in a pastoral context, so that mm. he's writing is not what I would call the highest of um, theological discourse, but it's pretty high. It's yeah. very sophisticated. Yeah. So that's his other works. I mean, they are tremendous. You know, it's not just the attributes and existence of God that uh, that are so well known. But every time I read Charnock, I'm blown away by how um, how well he writes, how clear. So, hmm. yeah, he he spent time in in Ireland. Um, he he was at Trinity College. Uh, he was studied at Cambridge and Oxford, like most of the Puritans went to one or both of the yeah. places. And uh, he was a pastor. He he actually um, went, uh, belonged to a gathered church at one time with uh, Thomas Goodwin and Thankful Owen and Theophilus Gale, who were, um, you know, well-known Puritans. So yeah. he, he was in quite a impressive intellectual and pastoral context. Huh? Yeah. And so that, maybe real, real quick, like about this book, like what actually, like, what is this book? Or what's this book yeah. supposed to do? This book, it's this book is our discourses um, on the. Uh, existence of god so the, the the book opens up with 
um, sort of does God exist and um, mm-hmm. proofs that of God's existence. And uh, it's a very classical treatment in many respects, but pastoral and, and then you get into the attributes of God. And so it's not every single attribute, although they ultimately are all covered in a certain sense, just by the very extensiveness of one attribute being discussed, others get. So you do have um, the attributes of God. And so I think there's, um, when it's all said and done, there's 14 discourses. Mm-hmm. Um, and these discourses range in length, but they're they're pretty long. They would be like easily a book published today in and of themselves. Yes. So um, <laughs> so you have the you have the two discourses of uh, God's existence, then on practical atheism. Hmm. Uh, and so it's very practical even in its discussion of God's existence. And then it gets to um, things like on God's being a spirit, but it's funny, it moves then to spiritual worship. So everything's designed for um, the church and people in the church so i say it's not at that it's not like a dry academic treatise it's it's pastoral and then you start getting into things like the eternity of god immutability omnipresence knowledge wisdom um power i think it is holiness and goodness and dominion and then i think the last one's was patience patience so mm-hmm. it's uh yeah it's 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 great great work hmm. so if some of the audience was wondering uh why is this stephen Charnock not going to be on the episode today. I guess you <laughs> answered that. <laughs> so dead for the why, why isn't... years or <laughs> however long it's been? Yeah, 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 yeah. This 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 book killed him. I guess uh, <laughs> he he wasn't finished uh, writing. You know, he, I think he could have carried on with a few more discourses, but oh, he, he died. So it was uh, too bad he didn't live another five ten years. Hmm. And maybe th- this is both for me and I think the audience. Um, why, why are they called discourses mm. and not like chapters or topics or anything like that? Yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's different words that are used historically, you know, you have a, a treatise or, um, you know, um, it's, it's, it's just the language of the time. I, I think this course sounds cool to be honest. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's like football and soccer, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody's like, how dare you say the same or two words for yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, you know, um, there's different phrases. I mean, you, you look at uh, how Luther referred to some of his writings, and um, yeah, just stylistically, and and what it means is it's it's a it's it's also an extended argument in a sense. Um, so yeah, it's just common language of the time. Okay. And then for for you, so I mean, this has been out there for <clears throat> hundreds of years, three hundred plus years. Um, but what uh, and this may be a, a simpler answer than maybe I think it is. But what got you interested in editing? Because I know you've written your own books. Um, yep. but what got you interested in editing Charnock's book? That was yeah, it wasn't really my idea. Uh, it was interesting because I've never really fancied myself as much of an editor. In fact, mm-hmm. one of my my biggest weaknesses is is editing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm like the worst editor they could have got. Um, for this work thankfully i had a lot of help from from very able people in in different respects um there was there were some guys who uh, david barshinger at crossway he's got a very very keen eye on on small details and stuff and then i have a few friends um michael lynch he's just finished work on bishop john davenant published with oxford university press but he's mm-hmm. He's he helped me with um, tracking down some of the bibliographic references and stuff. So what happened one day, I think uh, Justin Taylor uh, just contacted and said, hey, are you, would you be interested in editing Charnock? And I at first thought, yeah, sure. Why not? And when I first started, I sort of sent them an example and uh, they were so kind and gracious the way they responded. But I, I think it was probably not at quite the level that they were hoping for. So then I kind of started to learn a bit on the job and realized what a massive undertaking this was yeah. because I'd seen some reprints and stuff. And I've seen some editors of, of other works of Puritans. And I'm not even sure what they did, to be honest, they, their <laughs> name <is> there, but, <laughs> but it looks like the same thing, like copy paste and put it in nice. So this was a, this was a much more demanding work. My wife, you know, just said, are you still working on Charnock? Uh, <laughs> 
and she's never seen me work so hard on a on a on a book and i didn't even write it so that's what's funny <laughs> um, yeah. yeah it was just it was just jo justin taylor kind of picking me i don't know maybe he asked about 100 people before that but yeah, <laughs> yeah he's like please please God, can you take this over we've asked yeah. everybody else I need a sucker who's dumb <laughs> enough to take this on. Uh, what's 1700 page book. Can you do this, please? Yeah, there's a Canadian. Let's ask him. <laughs> so, They're really nice. Yeah. I'm British, so I'm not nice. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there you go. Uh, it was, it was, it was Crossway's idea. Gotcha. Mm. Okay. Uh, and then, so kind of getting into the editing work, cause this is <clears throat> like you said, it's not really like, editing the chapter so much or his language but it's like you provide some chapter summaries some commentaries maybe like what like what did like what what was your editing work like what did that consist of to help us read this oh well if you i mean if you've got an hour um let me get make a, <laughs> let me make it short to try and yeah. so so like every anything from paragraphs and run-on sentences were shortened hmm. um, just because you know, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 has this like massive run on center. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Puritans took bi uh, being biblical quite seriously, I guess. Yeah. Their so, titles were extensive as their sentences. The semicolon just goes, and I remember doing my PhD thesis and uh, Michael Haken was one of my supervisors. He said, Mark, you're starting to write like the Puritans. You know, you've got semicolons everywhere. And I was like, wow, you know, I'd actually, I, he was right. So uh, we've tried to, to, condensed sentences paragraphs were so long they were massive we shortened um paragraphs i've added some subheadings to just <laughs> orient the reader for the major sections of each discourse we had i had a lot more at first but then they just became too distracting so i had to then take them out um thus we have like different numbering not different numberings but diff better numberings of 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 how each discourse unfolds all of the greek hebrew Aramaic, uh, called the Chaldee paraphrasts. Um, mm -hmm. We've translated the Latin, huh. Greek, Hebrew, so that, huh. in, and if, every time it's used, it's been translated and you have the English okay. translation. So you're so, kind of your average person who doesn't know those languages can read this a little yeah. bit easier. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, Charnock usually provides the English translation, usually after the Latin, but sometimes he doesn't. Uh, so it was a case of uh, deciding when to let Charnock, you know, translate it and when to, we needed to do that. Um, the archaic words have been modernized. So hmm. doth becomes does or thou has become you. And and so even with the King James version, um, we've, we've modernized it. Some are probably going to freak out and, and not buy it for that reason alone. But <laughs> I think we, we did a pretty good, um, even, even doing the editing of the King James, like we've tried to be, um, not overdo it with how we've changed things, but enough to make it read. There's been um, many scriptural references that um, that need to be in the uh, footnote. They're in the footnotes. We've inserted them back into the body, and I've had to check the biblical references. Sometimes there was a biblical reference where he was off a of verse or a chapter, or it was just misquoted. So there are things like that. Um, for your great um glory and uh you know the, the british spellings have been americanized huh. uh so behavior is now behavior but there's no you that's um, right yeah yeah honor uh, is honor but no you as well yeah yeah so and then he would say mm. there's words like abhorrency which is now abhorrence mm. um it just things where there's uh, holy ghost is holy spirit mm -hmm. but then like on a more significant level um, not only is the punctuation modernized and the relative pronouns modernized, but um, the real glory of the book are the footnotes where we have looked at his footnotes and sometimes he'll just have a name hmm. um, and it's a last name like Mewis and nobody knows who that is. So we've had to go and find oh my gosh. about what work was he probably referencing and sometimes uh, I found and, and Michael Lynch and others have found um, amazingly where the work was, what page it was. And so you get the full bibliographic reference. So you get to see the scope of learning for Charnock. 
And you would miss that in the old editions because you just see little names here and there and you don't know who they are. So I'll say this is a Roman Catholic um, theologian who was out of born in Spain and so on. So you, you, you alert the reader to who he's interacting with um, and things like that. Mm. Okay. And then yeah. maybe too, for, for our listeners, Brooke, before next question, because um, I, I noticed <clears throat> you put chapter summaries that kind of like, I yeah. think they're fronted, right? So it's like yeah. you read the sam- summary and then to me, how, how does that help the, the reader? It, instead of just reading like the Charnock's full work without the chapter summaries, how does that help them read this a little bit better? Yeah, just if you want a kind of quick intro to what this chapter is going to be about, especially the doctrine aspect of, of what is he saying, I've tried to just summarize and, and crystallize the thought of a discourse into a, a chapter summary. So it just kind of prepares you to dig into the chapter. In fact, a lot of that work I had done in writing on Charnock and the existence and attributes of God in a Puritan theology, I wrote that oh, yeah. chapter on Charnock. And so I that took was Beaky. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I took some of that work and said, okay, you know, this will be, I think it'll be helpful to just, um, for readers who need a, a, to just gently sort of prepare their mind for what they're up up against in the next uh, thousand pages. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so that that was, uh, we thought it'd be good to have some chapter summaries. Awesome. Mm. Yeah, there you go. I mean, that's good for the audience to just even know what goes into editing and yeah. at work <laughs> like and so all the work that is and oh. tons tons of research so yeah. um as much so, as, yeah was this harder or easier than writing your own book oh much harder yeah um hmm. longer harder just i mean okay charnock this book is amazing so yeah it's well worth it but um usually i write a book and then someone edits it for me uh, so i was kind of doing the edit. relationship switched yeah somebody else wrote the book who's yeah. not dead and you have yeah. to edit it without his help. Exactly. So uh, I hope uh, it's a editorial job that uh, he would be proud of. Yeah. I, I, I'm very, um, um, I just kind of feel like the, the way in which it all came together. Um, if it isn't a team effort on these things, I, I very few people I think would be gifted enough because there's so many aspects to editing that, um, you'd really have to be like a genius to figure it all out. There's mm. things that no one guy can ever or person or um, mm. figure out. The, so I, I'm really grateful for the help um, that I got. Yeah. And even personally speaking, knowing that this is you're editing a work that someone else uh, wrote, was there a particular chapter or a part of a chapter that helped you personally uh, out with your understanding of God and his attributes and maybe some aha moments or something? You know, I'm looking forward to reading the book when it comes out. Uh, (laughs) And, (laughs) you know, I'm kind of serious in a sense because there's a, there's the work you do and then there's like sitting down and just reading it. And I never really was able to just read it for fun um i mean there were times when i was blown away and going yeah. wow had you read it before you edited it yeah the not, not the whole no um but i had read a lot a lot of it because i had worked with charnock before in a chapter but uh, i think if you just read the goodness of god discourse and spent some time really studying that one alone it, it would change your life it, it really would mm. i think there's got to be a, a way we can get the goodness of God discourse even summarized a bit and and put out there as a distinct volume. You know, like people have written on an actually the holiness of God or whatever. The goodness of God, that book needs to, I'm worried this two volumes won't get into the hands of like a lot of average sort of Christians. I Somehow the goodness of God's got to get into more people's hands because that's, that, that's what we're trying to do to get this into more people's hands for sure yeah yeah we need to then take the goodness of god and and maybe even summarize it and abridge, abridge it uh there's things that you maybe don't need to and and just standalone volume that would be a really excellent uh gift to the church could could you uh speaking of that goodness of god discourse is there something you could whet the appetite of the audience and like just explain what that means a little bit like, yeah. like just i know it's a huge yeah. definition but just yeah, yeah, something yeah. like I think people, what, do you, what do you mean yeah people think like oh goodness like i'm good is that like what you yeah. mean about god yeah it, it went, you know you kind of get to the goodness of god in discourse 12 so by then if you've been reading your your understanding of goodness has been uh 
illuminated by your understanding of God's wisdom and his knowledge and his holiness, his power, his immutability, his omnipresence. So God's goodness is not a goodness that can ever be understood apart from every other attribute. And that's why, you know, the simplicity of God is so important because anytime you look at God's goodness, you're looking at God's goodness as holiness, God's goodness as wisdom, it's powerful goodness, it's unchangeable goodness it's it's but then you know he'll write on like the goodness of god and then he'll have a little comment i think one of my favorites was he's applying it to christians and saying that there was a greater goodness shown to us sinners for a time than to even jesus christ himself when he was on the cross hmm. um you know and just a little you get phrases by Charnock that the sentence alone, it it's out of this world, the things he comes up with. And I, there's not, I'm not just saying this. I read, I've got Owen and Goodwin beside me right now as I'm reading them. But when I read Charnock, I, I actually think he's got the best way with words of all the Puritans more wow. than even more than Watson. You know, I read wow. that's, that's a huge praise. Yeah. Yeah. That's my opinion. I'm, I'm, uh, but I will fight. I will fight for it. We'll put, we'll put that on Twitter and see what people start yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah well, I don't, I don't go on Twitter because I know you're, it's, you're smart. It's a you're scary smart. place. I, well, I also don't yeah. have discipline to behave myself on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, talk yeah. about dealing with temptation yeah it's yeah. like yeah yeah the, i've got <laughs> owen i've got john owen on temptation and i'm pretty sure yeah. he told me not to go on twitter yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's and that's and it's it's really yeah it's really happening i've been reading um to the chagrin of a lot of christians for some reason but i'm, I'm reading a lot of Aquinas. yeah uh, on his on his understanding of immutability and perfection and he ties those with goodness and my my guess is my guess is Charnock has taken a lot of this like this classical thought and like bringing it to Christians today and like this is this is what the Bible says this is what yeah. the Bible says about who God is. Mm. Yeah. yeah, he's a pastor. You know, as much as he's a theologian, the best theologians I think have historically almost always been pastors. Yep. Mm. Uh, you know, they're just it's just what keeps their theology lively in a sense, mm -hmm. relevant and practical. It's it's and. I mean, God had one son and he made him a minister, as Goodwin said. And um, huh. so Charnock is 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 learned, but he's a pastor at the end of the day. Yeah. And maybe this isn't part of the questions we sent over, but I think it may be helpful for those to like wrap their minds around Charnock a little bit. Who are who are some of like I mean, maybe you, since you've edited this and you've seen the people that he references and that he um, some of the footnotes who are like who are his influences? Like who does who does he reading? Who is he influenced by? Yeah. To write? Yeah, that's, that's, um, it kind of gets the heart. I mean, there's these little debates that happen on the internet and stuff these days that come and go, right? And, um, you know, who, who are influencing our reform forefathers? Uh, what's amazing to me is Charnock doesn't seem to be embarrassed by referencing a lot of Roman Catholic mm -hmm. theologians. Um, <laughs> Suarez, for example, is a guy many people probably haven't even heard of. Um, mm -hmm. So Jesuits, Dominicans, uh, clearly Thomas Aquinas, uh, whether you like it or not, is massive yeah. influence on Charnock. I've been reading Aquinas and it's like, if you put Calvin's name in it, name in it I don't think you could, you couldn't tell the difference on yeah. the, like Doctrine of God stuff. Yeah, the, the Doctrine of God, like Charnock's is, clearly Aquinas is in the background for sure. And it's, but it's, you know, it's, it's more, I'd say fresher and easier to handle and, and just better yeah. for you soul reading charnock yep. yep uh so I, I don't i don't think of aquinas as someone where you know my i'm i'm going through a period of suffering and i'm like yep. okay i'm gonna open up you know i've got aquinas right there in my that but i would open charnock up to try and help me in a, a moment <clears> of <throat> suffering sadness or even anything else he has that ability so you've got roman catholics um there's the the amiro uh who you know people hear of Amaraldianism and get all scared, especially in reform circles. Um, Amaro was very influential uh, upon him. So you've he's got... Roughly like the, it's kind of like hypothetical universalism in a sense. There's there's that, yeah. There's some of those uh, theologians that, um, yeah. I mean, Amaro, it's, there's strains and different. Yeah. Um, but, you, you know, it's a case of just taking what is good from everywhere. There's contemporaries, there's Augustine, there's there's then there's also um poets and greeks and, mm -hmm. and and just 
anything that he feels he can use, he uses and he uses well, and he's not embarrassed about it. And he doesn't need to worry that someone goes on Twitter and says, turn <laughs> this papist you know, stay away from him um you know he plunders, he plunders the egyptians so to speak and um yeah that's you know, people will people will be surprised when they look at all of the references in the footnotes to who charnock was interacting with especially french theologians and uh because he spent time there and uh, yeah hmm. yeah so it's um I, i've nick has said this before but like he finds truth and he's like this is truth and this is going to help your soul um, regardless of where I find it, it's God's truth. So it's, here you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then you, you, I think you've kind of did this a little bit, but is, is there maybe a flow to Charnock's writing? So he goes from discourse to discourse from attribute to attribute. Is it something that like kind of strings this along together as he writes? Yeah. He, you know, you basically get a doctrine, he, he doctrine and explication and, and you get application at the end. And it's, it's really just a, a standard Puritan practice where there's uses they call them, or we would call it application. And so there's sometimes pages and pages and pages of, of how does this doctrine help you? How does it apply to life? Things like that. So the flow is, 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 it's, it's like, not really indicative imperative but it kind of has that feel of this is what we believe and this is what the teaching is and then how does this affect our lives so that's a pretty standard um way of of charnock and and most puritans to be honest um in how they de deliver their discourses or their books to um and and if their sermons which a lot of times they are uh have been reproduced and you know yep yeah. Then they always have application, which I think people will find a lot of helpful um, applications in, mm -hmm. in the doctrine of God. Hmm. And then last last little bit before before Nick concludes this. Um, so there's maybe a little bit of flow. Is there? Does he like have? So like, why does he start with one attribute and then goes to another? Does, does he have a, like a flow of like this is where I'm going to start? This is why this attribute comes first, and this is why this attribute comes next. Is there anything like that? Yeah. It's. I mean, you have. Uh, it's, I mean, obviously the existence of God comes first because he's yep. trying, he's establishing who, that God exists. Uh, and then he gets into the attributes. I mean, is there a, a flow to why you, you probably get um, what we call the absolute and relative attributes? So the absolute eternity, immutability, um, omnipresence, and then the relative attributes, things like wisdom. We, we have even communicable and yeah i was about to say it sounds exactly like that communicable and communicable you might kind of find that flow where he's dealing with the more absolute and communicable but it's it, I, I wouldn't want to make that a hard and fast um it's just a general approach even of, of dogmatics um yeah happen yeah people are wondering what that means absolute it's like things that are just like that's god and like we don't have any yeah. sharing with that and then the relative is like God is wis God is wisdom, and like we can be wise, although we're not perfectly wise. So yeah. Like, oh, what does that stuff mean? That's hopefully yeah. that helps to introduce that to them a little bit. Yeah, there were there were there were even debates among Reformed theologians on distinguishing the attributes and what yep. terms to use and all that. But uh, I think if to just basically bring it down to its lowest level, that would be um, what I would think. Gotcha. It sounds like as you're um, introducing Charnock to. The audience a lot of people probably weren't f too familiar with him and, and yeah as a puritan he had a lot of ecumenical doctrine he, he would talk about and you're talking about the trinity too and and even um knowing that he can use uh you know other um christian like, sources well, out yeah us, or, other christian sources even roman catholicism outside of reformed doctrine I mean, like non-christians using non-christians is like oh this this is still some good stuff too yeah. Well, and, and um, you know, the Trinity and natural theology is something Catholics do get mm -hmm. get right. And so and so Charnock just is reminding us, you know, there are certain doctrines ecumenically that we can we can pull from, we can use and we're not, you know, stuck in our own yeah. our own bubble. But, you know, speaking of that, um, as we conclude, based on your own engagement with Charnock's writing and your help with helping lay Christians, you know, like myself read the text uh how do you hope this helps us better understand our triune god uh, i think maybe this was this would be 
how I would look at it is, is, I mean, it's definitely like the basis. I mean, it just much, we have what's called essence appropriate language and persons appropriate language. So the emphasis here is on the, the essence of God and his mm -hmm. attributes, but there's, there is a lot on the Trinity. I think where it comes in is he, every discourse has um, a section also on Christ and how Christ relates to um, the attribute and sometimes he draws these remarkable contrasts between an attribute um, of God but then something about Christ's human nature but I think when you get Christ connected in so well with the attributes of God it does bring about the the sort of especially the what people call the economic trinity but you do you do learn a lot about the trinity in terms of his connections with Christ uh, in the discourses that's where I would say the the real gems come through mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, like you're talking about the doctrine of God and um, existence of God, maybe a real quick kind of question before, before we end after, after Nick's, um, but does he have like, what, what is his approach to the existence of God? And like, how does, how does he talk about the existence of God coming into his attributes? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty classical The it's, you know, if you remember the, uh, the, the proofs Aquinas is yep, the five proofs. They're, they're they're certainly there in the way he explicates them and i think once you he establishes the the fact of, of god's existence um at least in in how he writes um it's like okay what is god and then sort of who is god and and it's the there's this is i say fairly standard typical way to to do things um and uh, people sometimes get upset because they think like the Trinity should come first and then God's, up. but um, you know, it's just the way a lot of reform dogmatics um, were written in the 17th century and going back to the medievals is, is establishing God's existence, his attributes, and then um, his triunity. So I wonder if he would have done it later on a discourse on God's triunity. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of a different um different approach would i don't know if he would have it's it's, it's a mystery to me but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah gotcha well yeah this is this has been a really cool conversation kind of introducing a lot of our audience and i'm assuming a lot of people to try and if you've kind of been into the seminary scene or kind of in the reformed camp you might you might know who he is but if you're outside of them <clears throat> you may not know who charnock is um and especially a 1500 page work that's like oh this is, this is quite a bit yeah yeah, this is, this is a lot. Yeah, so thanks for um, editing this, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. I know it's it's a, it's a it's a labor of love. If mm -hmm. if you felt like love during some of this time, maybe yeah. just <laughs> this you just got to get done. Yeah, uh, but yeah, thank you for thank you for your work, and um, and yes. before we end, where can people find you, find your work, what you're doing, and, and maybe some stuff that you have coming up as well. Yeah, I, I try not to be found if that's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't um yeah i you know i my my stuff my books are, are pretty easy to find on google amazon things like that um you know then crossway you can find there'll be a pretty good sale i think on these two volumes so don't <laughs> get it off by the <laughs> yeah a little expensive yeah it won't be that at all they'll, they'll have some pretty good discounts i think you'll be able to get uh, like for example i'm selling um some copies of the book for around 50 dollars oh at, that's um, less than half of what it has right now yeah it's one yeah, my, what i see yeah it's one so it, I think you'll be able to get this at a pretty good um, price. I, I saw some comments on social media once about, hey, how are people supposed to afford this? I'm like, well, that's what the listed, but that won't be how much it is. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, my church faith van.com is where my sermons are. Um, I preach and that's basically the, the sum total of what I uh, want to be um, blessing the church with is my, my books and sermons and, anything else after that uh i'm not going to take any responsibility for <laughs> <laughs> that's wise yeah that's nice. good yeah well dr jones thank you so much for coming yeah. on for for this work um you know the stuff that you've written and introducing us to charnock and um mm -hmm. some, some great discourses that i hope help the church help individuals and they can learn and and, and better know and better worship their god yeah great thanks for having me on guys it's been a pleasure yeah thank, thank you, you.